when they train people to be professional tasters, a large part of the training is in learning a vocabulary for tastes and smells. The larger your vocabulary for smells and tastes, the more precise differences you're going to notice, the more distinctions you're going to be able to make, and the more useful you are as a professional taster. The same principle applies to a lot of the Buddha's teachings. He divides things into five aggregates, six sense spheres, six properties, all the factors that depend on core rising. Those are not superfluous teachings. They're there to throw a spotlight on things that are happening in your mind and give you a sense of distinctions. How is this perception, say, distinct from a fabrication? How are they related to feelings? Because on the one hand, you can't see relationships until you actually see that there are two things to be related. Otherwise, they're just a, a blob. And you want to know precisely where your cravings are. That's what all this is for. So you can spot them precisely. Otherwise, you can just say, well, I'm going to practice having no craving, no attachment, and make it a blanket thing. But then everything gets put under the blanket. You don't see precisely what's happening. You don't see the corners of your mind, because attachment and craving tend to hide out in dark spaces, spaces where you don't pay attention, things you don't see. And they create locations there. This is one of the, the aspects of craving that you have to look very carefully to see. The Buddha's description is that craving is located now here, now there. It's that craving that creates a location which becomes a basis for your becoming. It's the little nucleus or the seed for becoming. And if you don't know where the nucleus is, you don't really know the becoming. You just think it's just something that's already there. You don't see the extent to which you're creating it yourself. It's one of the purposes of getting the mind into concentration, is not just to have equanimity for everything. It's to give rise to the mindfulness and alertness. As the Buddha said, that's one of the uses of concentration. So you can see precisely when things are arising in the mind. And notice the mind's reaction. The more precise your vocabulary, the more clearly you'll see things, exactly where your craving is. So sometimes the craving is for the object, sometimes the craving is for the craving itself. Sometimes it's your perception of who you are. Sometimes it's your perception of saying, I'm a person with no craving, I'm a person who's totally free of attachments. You can be attached to that. And if you're not quick to see that, that's how the mind plays tricks on itself. And the craving will still be there. The becoming will still be there. In other words, the suffering will still be there. It may be very subtle, but it's still there. And as long as there's that potential for suffering, you can't really trust your mind, because it might stick with that particular large perception of an awareness that's located nowhere, and you're stuck on the perception. But then after all, you're not interested in that perception anymore. You go to something else. If you can't watch your mind as it moves from one location to another, in this way. If you, can't, if you can't catch sight of it, then you're missing precisely what you need to see. After all, if you're going to abandon your craving, you have to see exactly where it is. There's a strange passage in the canon where the Buddha says, if there's something you've never seen, could you have a craving there? And you might say, well, it's possible to have craving for the concept. Well, that's not where the craving is then. The craving is not with the thing you haven't seen. The craving is with the, and the concept. This is why you have to catch the mind, to see which layer of the mind, which layer of awareness, which layer of the aggregates you're focused on. Your, your craving finds its satisfaction, or looks for its satisfaction. So it's not just a blanket cloning of awakening, saying, well, awakened people are unattached, and so whatever comes up, I'll just see it as be unattached. 
you have to know, well, what is this whatever that's coming up? Do you see precisely what's coming up? And are there cracks in your awareness that allow the craving to take root and grow? So these different analyses are not just extra decoration that are irrelevant to the practice. They're there so that you can see this is what's happening, and then you can know what to do in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Because just having the, the vocabulary, again, is, in and of itself is not enough from being able to identify, well, this is a feeling or this is a perception or whatnot. The next thing to do is what do you do with it? Is it something that you develop or is it something that you let go? It's because we have these different duties that the Buddha has, Four Noble Truths. There's not just one big truth that everything should be let go of or all things are unworthy of attachment. That is one of the teachings, but that's a teaching for an arahant or someone who's on the verge of being an arahant. And we haven't gotten there yet. We've got these duties that we've got to fulfill. That teaching of letting go of everything, where there's no you here or there or in between, or there's no here or there or in between. That's a teaching that makes sense and is applicable only when you've done the grunt work of developing the path, abandoning, craving, all the cravings that you can see. So you're ready for the more subtle ones. So the vocabulary is there for us to use and to figure out what needs to be done to dig out the craving, to develop the path, and get to the place where we finally can let go of everything because we've seen all the, the hiding places in the mind. So think of those lists of categories, the aggregates and the sense spheres and the pinnacle rising, as a checklist for where you're going to look for the different hiding places for craving and clinging and all the other unskillful things that tend to hide out when concentration gets good and the mind gets more settled. You know, as your concentration gets more still, you're able to see a lot of the hiding places, but then there are little, little hiding places that get more and more subtle as your concentration gets more, more solid. So you've got to keep looking, looking, looking. This is why this is an all-around training of the mind. It's not just in the vocabulary, it's not just in the stillness, it's not just in letting go. There are different processes that have to be analyzed. Sometimes the concentration has to be developed so we can make it more solid and see things that are more precise. Sometimes you have to drop the analysis because the mind is getting worn out. And that's when you go for the concentration that's there for the basis of just giving you a pleasant abiding here and now. Remember, concentration has four uses. The pleasant abiding, mindfulness and alertness, knowledge and vision, which means the psychic powers you can develop, which of the four uses of concentration are the optional ones. And then finally, the ending of the affluence. In other words, the discernment that sees not only things arising and passing away, but also understands their origination, what's causing them, what their allure is, what their drawbacks are, and then how to escape from them. There's work to be done here in all these terms. The concentration is useful and helps in some of it, but the analysis helps in other parts of it. This is why it's a combination of stillness and insight, or calm and insight, concentration and discernment. These two qualities have to go together. When they're put together in the right proportions, then it's hard to say the distinction between concentration and discernment, because they're right there together, working together. You get the mind still, and you see something, you let it go, that makes the mind even more still. So don't dismiss the analysis, don't dismiss the concentration. One without the other can't do its work. Or it can do some of the work, but the really important work gets left undone. And when it's left undone, then you come back to more and more suffering. After all, you get tired of meditating, you latch on to something else, and you go back to your more gross cravings again. And this is how beings go through the cycle, up and down, up and down. 
the only safe place is when you get out. And the only way out is if you get all the factors of the path working together. So work on your concentration, but also work on the kind of concentration that allows you to see things clearly in the mind as they're coming, as they're going. So you can catch sight of the unexpected hiding places and where you've tucked things away. <laughs>